Good afternoon, uh, good afternoon, and uh, we are really uh, proud, honored to uh, perform this uh, live uh, case in the, this uh, great meeting, TCTAP, and uh, we are, I would like to thank you uh, for asking us to participate. Uh, of course, it's uh, thousands of kilometers, but we are from the camera, by the camera, very close to you. So, uh, I would like to introduce our team. I will work uh, today with uh, Benjamin Anton, who is uh, a leader of the uh, peripheral coronary and peripheral program with Antoine Sogui in our group, our fellow Pierre, our cardiac uh, anesthetist, uh, Laurent, uh, in the back. And we see that the job of today of this uh, uh, friend it will be uh, really important. And then uh, uh, Samantha and uh, Alison, uh, our nurse in the room. So maybe Benjamin, you can uh, present the case. So, dear colleagues and friends, it's a, it's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce this uh, complex case of uh, 57 years old woman. Next. So you can see that this patient didn't have any uh, risk factor, but she's suffering from a lot of comorbidity with a trisomy 23. She underwent Hodgkin disease in uh, this youngness with a radiation therapy on the chest and a slight impaired function. And his main history is driven by a transartic valve implantation last year because of BQSPD. And she comes from in our institution for an unstable angina, actually. Next. So the echography show uh, a slight impairment of the uh, left ejection fraction. And the catheterization of the coronary show very critical and complex lesion of the distal vein main involving both ostia of the circumflex and the LAD. Next. So, because this lesion is probably uh, dryly mine because of the radiation, it's a very calcified lesion, and we plan with Jean to perform a preparation of the plaque with rotablation. Next. So, the key points of this uh, case is that we deal with the left main disease, we will need a rotative aterectomy, and because the two ostia are involving a two stent bifurcation technique. Next. So you can see on the angio, this critical lesion uh, involving both the ostia, next. And we see that there is a huge LAD, so we will try to perform a decay crush from uh, the left main to LAD and a side range with a circumflex. So, do we see a, um, a sapien stent there? I okay, mean, so stent valve. Uh, I, I mean, that, that part I didn't. We didn't hear about. <laughs> so she had a taver. So she she, she has a, she underwent she underwent a, a transartic valve implantation because of a BQSPD in two hundred and sixteen. Ah, okay. She was contraindicated to open cell. And surgery, at that time so there was no lesion. At that time there was no lesion there in the in the. Uh, in in the left main. At that, at that time, there was a, yeah. At that time, there was a mild lateroma, 20% stenosis, uh. but not significant. We reviewed uh, the senior angio, uh, and it was. And uh, in three years, there was a critical uh, progression of coronary artery disease. So I would like to show you now uh, the the views that we have taken. We are working by the six French uh, right transvascular approach. Uh, this is the AP view, uh, uh, and uh, uh, here we have the AP a little bit crudel. You could see the calcium, the critical lesion at the ostium of the circumflex artery. The circumflex artery gives uh, two uh, big uh, branches, uh, distal to the lesion. Here there's a first uh, 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 spider view. And you could see the, the block of calcium uh, in, uh, taking, uh, interesting the, the origin of the circumflex and the origin of the LAD. Uh, this is the certainly the view that uh, we will, uh, this, this will be our working view. Uh, it's a LAO 46, codal 23. It's massive calcif calcification. 
And uh, here we have the, the cranial view with a beautiful LED distal to this lesion, mild lateroma, and uh, the right coronary artery is normal, absolutely normal. So that's the, the, the lesion today. And uh, what we will do is to, uh, we have already placed the six French uh, XB 3.5 guiding catheter. We have uh, already uh, uh, placed uh, a rotor wire uh, in the first uh, OM branch. And uh, now we will advance uh, the 1.25 millimeter burr, and two sir, millimeter burr. So we will use a 1.25 millimeter burr for the circumflex, and one. Il faut remettre l'image de référence, s'il vous plaît, and 1.5 millimeter burr for the uh, uh, for the LED. So unbelievable case. I mean, I okay, think incredibly course, uh, complex. Okay, of course, you have different uh, solution uh, to uh, to do that. Yeah, no, yeah. I think uh, you have an incredible case, and and obviously, uh, very very difficult. Six Both branch. huge oh, branches are severely calcified. Probably need rotational arthrectomy on that's, both sides. So um, we have a great this panel. This Anybody have any comments? Any questions? The patient now has a permanent pacemaker, so they won't use any... Uh, yeah, I guess you're, you're not using a pacemaker here. Um, <laughs> since the, it looks like the patient has a pacemaker, Jean. Is that correct? Sorry? So the, the question came about the pacemaker, but it looks like you already have lots of wires there. This patient has bi-V pacing already? Pacemaker? Yeah, the, the patient has uh, already a pacemaker implanted. Uh, so, uh, okay. well, with uh, uh, the, the, this problem of uh, we could uh, happen during rotoblator, we are covered by the uh, the permanent pacemaker. Okay. Well, we're going to watch you because this is a quite quite an incredible case, obviously, uh, and we'll let you. We'll watch you work here. Uh, I see that you chose to go into the circ first. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter. CERC or LAD, there is a lot of calcium. Mark Embe. Do you have a kind of backup for even an MS support? Okay. So we advance the wire during the dinner glide. Okay. Tire le peu. So one question was about hemodynamic support, but I guess you have very good LV function. And I guess if there's a need, uh, I'm sure that... Uh, yeah, it's 45% ejection fraction, yeah. Felix, mm -hmm. Do you think some of those might be thrombus? Because okay, you present test. with acute coronary I syndrome. think we can test now. John, why not starting with 1.5? Yeah, but the patient was uh, treated now with uh, low, low molecular heparin, aspirin, and uh, uh, clopidogrel since uh, three days now. So I think that we could be, it should be okay. Uh, so what we have to do is to take a better support with the guiding, okay, like that. And now we will start the ablation. Okay, that's fine for the, the proximal uh, surf. Montreal electrodes, okay. SCG is good. And now what we can do is to the, remove the burr. Go on. So Benjamin is removing the burr on the dinner glide. Uh, the, the, it's a 60 uh, southern RPM during the pullback. There is no uh, ECG changes, no, uh, for the pressure now, the. The valve is open, we will see the pressure in a few seconds. Okay, that's fine, we are out. Now we will look at the pressure. Pressure is good, and now we take a view. Okay, Benjamin? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. So now what we can do is to uh, uh, advance the wire in the distality. And we take a second wire for the LAD. And when the second wire will be in the distal LAD, 
we will remove the LCX wire because, of course, we cannot uh, rotablate with a, a side wire. Are you putting another rotablator wire in that LED? So now we will... Uh, in LED, uh, yeah. In the same yes. one, it's the floppy one. Okay. Will you dilate the side branch before That's you go right. down yeah, to, uh, right. to do rotational atherectomy in the LAD? No. Just to stabilize no, your no, rotation? No, I think we do first uh, the rotablation uh, because the risk with the balloon, uh, Roxana, the risk of the balloon is to have a dissection. So I prefer to just to open with the burr, uh, first the circ, second the uh, osteal LAD, and then we will uh, uh, do the balloon angioplasty, and then we can, could discuss together uh, the technique that you're talking yeah. about. Uh, Roxana? Uh, yes. Would uh, John prefer to have some interrogation with Ivus? I think at this time, right now, the moment uh, is to In this to particular do. case, it is so, yeah. I mean, I, 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 it's a very it's good... It's so calcified, you know, uh, that... Yeah. Uh, I think it's a very good I question, but I think at thing. this point, uh, the, 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 the first the problem, thing to do is to... to yes, do. exactly. It's a bit too late now, yeah. So the problem would be if we could not cross... Uh, no, it's okay. okay. Uh, now, uh, we, to be sure, we will uh, change the view. Uh, the, the distality, the tip of the wire is a little bit destroyed. Uh, now we can uh, come back to the cranial view in order to see uh, where is the, okay, where is the distality of the wire test. Uh, quite difficult uh, because uh, the wire is a little bit destroyed. But anyway, it's a uh, Ah, oh, you're test. doing a beautiful job. So now what we have to replace, <laughs> uh, be sure that the wire is uh, in the main vessel and not in the side branch. All oh, the time, we have to be sure that uh, the wire is the main vessel. If I cannot uh, place the wire more distal in the LED, I will pull back and leave the wire at that point. We can do that. We wire here. And now, at that, uh, at that time, I have to remove the first uh, the introducer here. Second, the, the side wire. I will remove the side wire, take the side wire. Hello. And now we advance uh, the 1.5 millimeter burr for the left main LED. C'est bon, on va faire comme ça. Very nice. I wonder why Jan, she's so tachycardic. So she concerning the, I will show you. Why is her heart rate Sorry, so high? I, I saw that her heart rate was very high. Is she in sinus rhythm? It's a sinus rhythm, and uh, the, 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 our cardiac uh, anesthetist, uh, Laurent Sidobre, injects some, uh, you know, uh, drugs in order to have uh, a good pressure. And wow. uh, you, you will see that uh, there is some uh, ST depression now. Yeah. Uh, the pressure is going a little bit down, so I think that uh, it's time to go quickly to the uh, LED. Go on. Yes, yes. We're we're just oh. watching. Okay. This is. Okay. You just you just do the work. We'll just watch here. No, no, no. We can uh, uh, answer to the question. Uh, no problem. No problem. Hmm. But you know, you did a beautiful job the handling the wire. The Usually, the you know, we don't we don't do the bare wire in a case like that. We will come and use an introducer. But um, Jean Fajardet is a master, real master. Pull, 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 pull. Okay. Thank you for the master. We can see this at, at the end of the of the case. I don't know. Les bains, s'il vous plaît. Okay. So you can so, see that uh, lesions induced by radiation are very calcified, very test. fibrosis. That's yeah. always difficult to treat it. Test. Yeah, a lot. Okay, so it's fine. So I just advance. Uh, yeah. Pull, pull, pull. Attention, pas plus. J'avance. 
Okay, we can uh, start uh, from the from the left main, I think. Okay, nice. we go. What's interesting is to see how easy you're able to access the uh, coronary arteries through this, you know, with the sapien valve. I mean, I think it would have been maybe, maybe a little different with a core valve, no? Mettez-moi 125 000, là, on y va. C'est bon. Okay. Now we can uh, remove it. Attends. Yeah. Yeah. Did I glide? I mean, there's no other Attention. way to yeah. treat a yeah. lesion yeah. like yeah. this without rotational atherectomy. We, okay, you stop, know, we stop. Would be impossible. Pierre. SJ Park is just uh, here now. Yeah, it's a left main uh, Yeah. I have questions. Yes, and, yes, please. Uh, in Japan, in this case, it, we usually perform the intravascular imaging for IV yeah. or OCT or confirm the rotational effect or something. And uh, maybe a lot of the classification is there, so we have to evaluate the residual classification or something like that. Yeah, no, I think there's no question that we did. We had a session just before speaking of the utility of IVIS, especially in a case like this, or imaging for to guide us. And certainly, I think after a rotational atherectomy, after you do maybe some the balloon dilatation, I don't know if you're considering doing any kind of oui, imaging, ballon. but uh, Jean, ouais. you will tell us. The question is about imaging. Yeah, yeah, but imaging for when we have a high calcification like that, and, uh, and again, I will show you the first view. Look at that. It's no, a I, block of calcium, uh, and uh, you see, yeah, no question, and I'm not, not sure before, that uh, after, the imaging though. will uh, give us. Ah, after, yes, after, yeah, yeah, yeah. because uh, I think, I think sure the problem will be understand. to have uh, uh, a good expansion of the stent. No, he didn't. Bon. And uh, the LAD, and geographically, it's at least 3.5. The circumflex for proximal circ will be at least 3, maybe 3.5. So. I'm sure that we could finish with a 4.5, 5 millimeter stent in the left main. Okay? Yes. So, uh, so, so tell us what's your plan now. You will, uh, you will wire both, you will do balloon dilatation and then IVIS, or, yeah, now the, or the, are you going to go straight to a stent? Yeah, the, No, the plan now is uh, we will uh, advance the, the wire in the circumflex. It should be a BMW wire in order to have a good support. It's true that we can uh, leave, uh, you see, the, the, the wire, uh, the rotor wire, and we can work on the rotor wire. Uh, but it's better because it's calcified to have a good support. So this is the first wire in the circumflex. Le guide, il est toujours dans les il, il est toujours, oui. We have the wire now, uh, the second wire in LED. So maybe what we can do is to uh, place the second wire in the LED. And uh, les ballons. now we will uh, balloon, the, the, we predilate with a balloon. Uh, the balloon size will be, uh, could be a 3.0 for, uh, for the LED. 3.0 for the circumflex, and then we will uh, do the double stand strategy. Concerning the double stand strategy, uh, we have several options. Just the first option could be uh, to use a tap, and uh, in other words, to place a stand from the left main LED, uh, and then uh, after doing the post dilatation recross the, 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 the stent and place an additional tube by the ostium of the circumflex, uh, this is possible to do it. The second uh, will be to uh, the DK crush. The advantage of the DK crush is to, uh, you know, to, to uh, protect immediately the, uh, the circumflex. 
and to be sure that the circumflex uh, will stay open during the procedure. Um, the yeah, data so of the decay crash are not too bad, and uh, so why not? But yeah, so now what we will do, we will predilate first, and then we will see, you know, by angiography, the result after the predilatation. And this angiography result will certainly dictate uh, our strategy. Qu'est-ce que vous avez comme ballon? Yeah, so we have Dr. Shevan here. So, uh, Imad, uh, is there any other way you would do this other than DK crush? Hello, how are you? Well, uh, I'll, uh, I'll start with uh, ensuring uh, the uh, access to uh, circumflex because it's dominant circumflex. And I think I'll go stenting, starting from uh, circumflex, whether with uh, DK crush or mini culotte could be. But DK crush will be fine. Allez, reprend le 3, l'autre 3, s'il te plaît. The mini culotte also could be done. Eh? I any, other, so. any other thoughts on okay, the panel? Okay, now we are other in the LED. DK crush. Go on, test. Like it's open. Test. It's open. SJ? SJ, how would you stent no, this? No, no, it's By both, both Pierre, arteries yes. are... Pierre, the layout, s'il te plaît. Okay, go on. Now we are in the LED. 3.0 balloon. It's a 3.0. It can go up to 16, 18 atmosphere. Okay, pressure down. But it's nice. The balloon dilated nicely. Very good. You know, the 1.5 burr really did help you to expand the vessel. Yeah, absolutely. I fully agree, Oksana. That, that, that's a good news. Eh? When you see the shape of the balloon during inflation, that, that's, this is a good news. Mm -hmm. So you would decide your strategy of stenting not angiographically, no, not by Ivis? The, the Yeah, 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 yeah. In this particular case, uh, with uh, heavy calcified, calcification, you know, circumflex. We know that uh, uh, the size of the, the the stent at the end will be at least a 4.55 millimeter. Uh, we could uh, check at the end uh, by uh, Ivus, uh, but uh, again, the the most important is to, to predilate, to uh, open with uh, quite high pressure in order to be sure test that the stand will cross. Okay, go on. We have the marker just at the bifurcation of the third, the distal marker. This go is on. the 16. same 3.0 balloon? It's a 2.5 or 3.0? 3.0. 3.0, huh? Yeah, same 3.0 zero, zero, zero balloon. Rupture. Okay, bound. Okay, press, uh, we rupture, take rupture. a pressure. Rupture. We take a view. Ready? Oui. Well, it's not too bad. So I think that if we want to do correctly the things, we will see. We will have to. Uh, it's uh, almost a trifurcation, bifurcation. isn't it? That's a problem. We will yeah. take another view. Yeah. That was my question, actually. Yeah. What's your strategy That's a for the second uh, uh, bifurcation? I will try to do the circumflex instead of the marginal mm -hmm. wiring. To do the things simply, but um, maybe we need to uh, place a stand. Uh, 18 millimeter length in the circumflex. So take, uh, go on. Re yeah, remember that the balloon was a 15. So I think that with the 18 millimeter, it should be okay. But but the, I think it's a good question here. Would you put a wire okay, so into the circ? Okay, so what you can do? Take a crash. Jean, crash. Allez, take a crash. Who says it's right. Jean, would you put a yeah. wire into the circ, the the regular, uh, the main we will circ? See. We will try to. No. And, and actually no, 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 stand no. across we will this. We will, we will try to. Uh, yeah. We because will I think it will be harder wires, to rewire that in do that the angulation. Do the DK crash on the distal left main. And then we will try to rewire. Okay? C'est celui-là? Circumflex. Allez, on y va. Sur celui-là, on met le. Un 3 par. Donnez-moi un 3,18. Okay, so it will be uh, the first uh, uh, Xyans uh, 318 DES. So you're on choosing 3.0 in that uh, the proximal surf, not 3.5? Through the, three the OM branch. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, 
then we could postulate, but uh, yes, at the beginning, you know, when you look at the size of then, the install... Why uh, not IVUS at this point? I mean, it can you. help you in, the, in uh, characterizing the plaque, how to go in stenting, whether to distal cirque or to marginal, as you... What, what, why not now, IVUS? Yeah, I have to, I have to, I have to tell you, I'm doing IVUS, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, left main... Uh, PCI and in 90, more than 90% 90, 90 of the case without uh, imaging. Uh, so uh, I know that uh, it's important, but with experience, I think it's not uh, necessary. But this is my, uh, you know, my advice. Eh? I can, uh, you, you, you could not be, uh, uh, agree with me, but uh, just, no, this is not too bad. Eh? I think it's good. Uh, give me a, maybe a four millimeter balloon, four zero. We did a lever. In LED, left main LED. Donnez-moi un 4 zero par 15, by 15. So are you thinking about a tap or a DK? It looks like DK, mini DK, mini DK crush. Well, mini, I think when we do the mini crush, yeah, DK crush, yeah. So we now we will uh, place the the, the stent, we, we place the stent in the circumflex, we will place the balloon in the left main uh, uh, LED, de ballon 3 par 20. we will open the stent of the circumflex, then we will remove the balloon and the wire of the, of the OM, and then we will uh, crush with the balloon, the 4 millimeter balloon, and then we will recross, and uh, we will place a stand and then a second uh, crash. Okay, this is a balloon inside the left main LED. It's not too bad. Well, we have to pull the, the stand a little bit. Like that, like that. I think it's okay. I pull the balloon. Okay, picture again. Okay, maybe the, we can advance the stand a little bit more. It's, the, it's not necessary to have a test. Test. Okay, here is okay. Okay, deep uh, inflation, delivery of the stand now. So 12 atmosphere, in order to avoid, uh, to have a dissection, distal to the, to the stand in the OM. So it's a moderate pressure, and then we will pull back a little bit the balloon, and we take 20 atmosphere. Pressure down. So now I pull uh, back the balloon here, and now we take uh, 18, 20 atmosphere. 20, 22. Okay, pressure down. So now what we will do is to remove the balloon, and remove the wire. Which wire is it? This one? The circumflex. I'm not sure. This is LED. So remove this one. Huh? Okay. So now we have a single wire and a single balloon in the left main LED. C'est bon, c'est celui-là? Tu as enlevé l'autre ballon? C'est celui-ci ou... Non, 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 ça c'est le ballon. Le stent est là. Ok, we remove the, the balloon of the, 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 the stent. And now uh, we take a view, test. And now we will do the first, the first uh, crush. So we crush the stent with the balloon. And now it's a... Combien 3-0-5, It's a 4 zero. So we can go up to uh, 12, 14. Pressure down. Hello, uh, bien. We have to look at the hemodynamics because uh, look at the pressure. We inflate several times in the left main. So the pressure is not too bad. The systolic is uh, 85. That, that's fine. So. Take a view of that. 
Okay, this is not too bad for the circumflex. No, now the next step will be to recross the stand thrust and replace a wire, place a wire again <coughs> in the OM branch. It's an BM, but if you want something else. No, no. We'll use the, the same uh, wire, a BMW wire. It's possible to use a hydrophilic wire. Uh, concerning the, uh, the advancement of the wire, uh, it's true that uh, normally we try to, uh, for the, the other techniques, uh, to go from the distality to the proximal. Here is a little bit different. We try to do from the proximal. Test slowly. Here that's not too bad. I think we have crossed. Magnific. Yeah. Okay, now we have crossed. So we leave the now. It's three millimeters. Do you know Three millimeters. This is a three millimeter balloon that we will place through the struts. I hope that we could uh, cross. Uh, if not, we will take a 2.5 or 2.0. And uh, we will do the first kissing with a four millimeter, the and same and balloon and in the left main LED. So this is the first. Kissing balloon. Tu l'as le 4. Reprends celui qu'on avait, s'il te plaît, Pierre. OK, we have crossed. Good. That's good. Now the second balloon on the LED wire. Tu as un ballon ou un 3.5 Donne-moi un 3.5. So it's a 3.0 in the side cinq. branch, a 4.0 in the main. We can take a 3.5, no problem. And this is just to optimize yeah. that opening into the, into the circ... Uh, Stand strut. Yeah. And then, after, the, after this first kissing balloon, we will advance the, the stent in the left main LED. This will be a four millimeter stent. And uh, then you will kiss we will again. look at the, the, the length uh, in the different views. And then we will redo the second kissing. Uh, it should be finished. It's interesting. And if the we main will finish by the final good, part. Still. Yeah. Okay, the balloon in LED is there. We have the two balloons placed. Are you ready? Six. Eight. Eight on both. Ten on both. Twelve. Fourteen. Sixteen on both. Pressure down. Okay. Now we pull the LED balloon. We pull the LCX balloon. We'll take a view. And of course we have to uh, remove the wire again. The, the wire of the OM That's branch. Right. Uh, we, we, we can gel it. We can gel it. We can gel, but it's, uh, it's, we it's, cannot it's, use high pressure. Because of the decay, the, yeah. the double but kissing, it. we can gel the, the balloon. Shoot. That's, That's okay. better. So now, uh, give me, we have to look at the, the length. The length of the stand uh, should be at least 23. Uh, if you use the cranial view like that, we will have to cover from the ostium to the mm. proximal, to the origin of the small diagonal. To that and small I think first it diagonal. Be 20 feet. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, at, least at least 23, 23 I would say. Maybe even at 26. Be, or 28. 28. 28, yeah. Yeah. 20, or 20, 28. 20, so, yeah, 28. 28 will be comfortable. Don't, 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 I think. Uh, alors, we can take a 3 5 <laughs> because I don't want to. Uh, uh, to be aggressive to the mid uh, LED, the and proximal LED, 3528. Zion. And then you will uh, post okay. with bigger balloon. Yeah, with a, should be the 4.5 or 5 mm balloon. LED? Celui-là, c'est le IVR. IVR. Okay. This is a, a 3.5 by 28 Xions. Uh, and we will optimize on the left main with a 4.5. 
So here we have the, the stent. This is a 28, I think it was the right length. So now what we have to do is to be sure that we take the ostium. So uh, the we'll disengage a little bit the guiding. And I pull the, the balloon like that. We can take one view here and then we'll go to the LAO cranium. Here's not too bad. And now we move to the LAO cr cranium. Ready? Yeah, picture of that. I think it's not too bad, eh? look. Maybe we can pull back a, a millimeter. Yeah, one millimeter back. Test. Yeah, you, I agree. Test. Big shot. I think it's okay here. One millimeter back, one more. Big shot. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's good. good. Here it's good. Okay. Okay. It's all right. So you know that we left, uh, we left the wire in the circumflex. This could be done, uh, but then we have to remove before the pot. Okay. So, c'est prêt? C'est bon? Six. Just six. Eight. Eight. Stop. We did the circumflex. It's okay. It's the circumflex. Okay, now we can remove the LCX wire. Okay. Attention. Oh, yeah, right. Do so. Le ballon de quatre et demi. I pulled the the balloon, the three the three point five balloon inside the 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 left uh, the rota. Okay, go on. And here we can take twenty atmospheres. Because it seems that the stent is well deployed. Yeah, it's gonna it's uh, correct. Pa, pa. Okay, pressure down. And now we will post delay it with a 4.5 millimeter balloon. And maybe we, we did a final report with a 5 millimeter. But at first, the 4.5. So the you post dilate that before you go to par, par, your par, final par kiss? kiss the maximum. Because you still have one more kissing to do. Yeah, I think that uh, it's better to do the. Uh, it, it, yes, it do, it's better at that point at that point, to do a pot with a large balloon, high pressure, inside the proximal part of the stand, of the left main stand. And then we will uh, uh, place again a wire in the OM branch. We will do the final kissing. And after that, we will do a final pot. OK. So it's a lot of steps. Eh, with the, it's true that the tap technique is uh, easier to do, uh, but... Uh, but I think this is better for the patient, honestly. Okay, two, here. two very large branches, and Just, you really are securing very good results. Yeah. So what we can do is to uh, look at the test a little bit too. Okay, here we, we are. Here is good. It's good. Good position of the balloon. It's a 4.5, and we open it. So 18, 20 atmosphere with a 4.5 millimeter balloon. Pressure down. Maybe we could advance a little bit more distal. The, place the marker like that. Here, okay. go on. 14 again. 16, 18. Very good. Pressure down. Yes. Okay, now we pull back the balloon. We remove the uh, left main balloon. Next step will be to advance the wire again, the BMW wire, back into through the, the OM branch. This is Very not too good. bad now. Beautiful. Back into the cirque, exactly. And the good one point more is kiss. that the cirque itself, or the Four second one branch, or the, the cirque, and it's not too bad. Eh? The wire, the, oh, the flow is good. Maybe with, uh, it will be not necessary to place a third wire in the in the uh, in the cirque. We will see. Uh, at present time, it's not too bad. So now. Uh, here, oh, so the interest of the of the double kissing is to facilitate this tape, particularly because you don't have to cross three struts, but only two. So at this point, the DK crush. One of the interests is not the only one, but one of the interests is to facilitate the, the crossing. Okay, we are. So now kissing. 
Uh, 3-0 again for the... 3.5, both. 3-0 in the OM, in the circumflex. C'est un 3-0 C'est un 3.5. Uh, so 3-0 and a 4-0 or 3-0 in OM and... Uh, Four. And 4 0 in yeah. 3 yeah. 0 in the circumflex yeah, and uh, 4 0 in oh. the left main LED. Yeah, that makes sense. The cut. Yeah. And then we will finish by the final pot. It should be 4 5 or maybe 5 millimeter. We take 5. Proximal to the bifurcation. The cut, oui. Yeah. Okay, this is the 3 0. Yeah. Okay, here we are. Okay. The four. That's nice and how it went, one. and it was a used balloon. Yes. Yeah. That part but really This is you. in the rest of the double kissing. In other words, we have to cross uh, what uh, Benjamin said, a single layer of threads. And uh, so it's a reason why it's quite easy. It could be impossible with... Uh, the old uh, fashion to do the, the mini crush technique. Yeah. Okay, here. Okay, test. Kissing. Are you ready? Yeah. Uh, the points. circumflex, we can do it. Okay. Who is circumflex, the circumflex? LED. Okay, go on. Six, eight, ten, twelve on both. Pressure down. Who has the circumflex? You. I have the circumflex. So what I will do is to do first uh, high pressure to be sure that the stand of the circumflex is correctly open. So here we have 20 atmospheres with a 3.0. Okay, pressure down. We will come back again with a, a kissing balloon. Are you ready? Oui. And uh, for the kissing, we can take 12. It's not necessary to, to use very high pressure. Okay, very good. Here. And uh, now the next step, and I hope that will be the final step, will be the, the final pot. Five millimeters by 10. So five millimeter balloon uh, by 12, if you have a 12. If you have a 15, five. If you have a 15, uh, we will place the balloon inside the aorta, no problem. You okay, think your stent is well dilated the, the, after the, the bifurcation, the, the LED well, we stent? Do you think that needs any more post dilatation, the, the LED stent uh, after the bifurcation? Back. We could come back uh, to have, uh, yeah. Just because I you're can, not we, using IVIS. We can IVIS. come back if you want with a 3.5 millimeter stent. Yeah, LED. Pressure. Pressure. LED. Yeah. Donnez-moi un 3.5 par... It's a good, uh, it's a good uh, test. It's a good comment. It's a good comment, Roxana. So we, what we can do... It's not too bad, eh? look. Um, and what we can do is to place a 3.5 mm stent. On a un 3.5 par... Par 15, on en a un sur la table. That looks really good. And I agree. We will take 20 atmosphere with the LED stent. LED balloon. Okay. With the 3.5. LED is this one. Yeah, because you only went up to 12. I, fully, I, 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 um, I follow your advice. Or, or yeah, you yeah, could yeah, just yeah, do really. IVIS if you You're wanted. Right. Yeah. And if I follow your advice. I think it is important to do IVIS in and this uh, case since uh, we the will calcification, heavy calcification and the expansion of the stand is not guaranteed by high pressure. Oh. So I, I think IVIS will be needed here. Yeah, but uh, I, I agree, but you know, and if I use, we take 20, 25 atmosphere, and then what to do, we have no other option, so, uh, again, so, not sure, not sure, and uh, really, uh, I know that this is the way to recommend, but it's not the way that we, we work in, the, in our center. Yeah, and we have works, to go with the way you. Professor Fajade is doing his But case. we take every time 20 atmosphere, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are really giving no, very no, good. Yeah, but I'm 20, glad that you 22, went up to 20 22. there. 22. Beautiful. Mm. Okay, 22 atmospheres. And now what we can do is to take a view 
uh, an injection angio in this view. Do you hear? Only shoot. To see the LED. Ah, it's wow. beautiful. It Very nice. Good. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and now the big stand for the final part. Mm -hmm. The big stand for the final part. Uh, in, in the LED. With this 4.5 maybe? Just okay. a 4.5. Four. Four. Four we can five? leave the LCX wider. 5.0. 5.0. Wow. Okay. 5.0. So you don't need Ivo. That's why yeah, you but, don't uh, need Ivo. Yeah, because it's uh, at least free. No, because why? We're, we're, it's a 3.5 millimeter LED. It's close. It's more than 3.0 in the circumflex. If we apply the, the low, mm. the Fine low, it's a five per, so it should be four A to five millimeter balloon for the the, the left main. Mm. Okay, what we can do is to advance the okay, here we are. And now of course we have to place the distal marker of the balloon proximal to the bifurcation. Mm. That is very, very, very important. So, so we that's take a, a view. really good point. Very important. The distal marker. Seems very okay. good. Very good position. Six. Eight and. So it's 12. a five. So I am fourteen. Semi compliant. So five, fourteen atmosphere, sixteen atmospheres. Okay. Pressure down, and now we will uh, go to the LOO cranio to be sure that we have taken the osteum. And uh, remember that uh, test. I think we have to pull back, yes, a little bit the balloon. I pull back, uh, disengage my guiding catheter. I place my balloon here with the, proxy, the proximal marker inside the aorta, and then we can take again 14 atmospheres. Mm -hmm. 14. Stop. Press, rupture. No, no, no. Si, si. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Pierre qui avait... No, no, injecte pas. Okay. Pierre qui avait okay, go on here. No rupture? No rupture. Okay, perfect. It was injection of the... Okay. Very good. Then now we can inject. No, no. Oh, okay. Attends, on. Pressure on. Attends, attends. Pressure on. Vas-y. And we can inject. Go on. And we are sure that the balloon you see is inside the aorta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the very nice. Down. Pressure down. Uh, maybe it's, uh, we can have a, a last one here, a little bit more proximal. Go on here. Inflation, just five seconds. Test. Very good. Pressure down. Now it's time to the, the, uh, remove the balloon eh, because uh, the pressure is going down. Uh, this is, good, is normal. So we keep the guiding disengaged. Now we look at the pressure. Flush. Uh, I remove the balloon. Okay. How is the pressure? Yes, pressure is pressure good. Pressure is good. Okay, we can take a view like that. Ready? Big shot. Very good. Very good. And uh, we will look at the LAO cranio. And if it's good, we will uh, remove the wires. Uh, so I, I, I engage uh, the guiding on the two wires, you see. I use the two wire to guide the guiding catheter, place the guiding inside the left main. <coughs> ah, this is good, huh? What do you think? It seems good, huh? Yeah, and the circumflex, we, we accept this result. Mm. Okay, and now we, what we will do of the main is to remove the wires. To leave it. Yeah, I think we can uh, uh, accept that because okay. uh, <laughs> not much you know more the target to was uh, the left main, and uh, we will see. Go on. Give some nitro. It's not too bad. No, that looks good. One. Beautiful. We can now use another one here. Very good. See, I said you were one the master. <laughs> uh, it seems good. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, 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 absolutely no. No, 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 it's just, uh, you know, following uh, uh, a strict protocol to do the DK crush, and uh, it's true that uh, Xiaolong Sheng uh, explained very well the, uh, 
the way to do it. And uh, it's true that uh, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice technique for these kind of things. Zoomé. Yeah, but honestly, you showed us very Zoomé. beautifully, step by step, in a highly calcified region, Zoomé, si two rotational burrs down both side branches, and a step by step, perfect DK crush with excellent uh, pot. And for the, for the final result, this looks beautiful. Really, really beautiful. I think that's an overlap. I don't, I don't think it's a problem. No, I certain. think that is interesting because, it, 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 yeah, I will show you the, the next one. And uh, uh, I think it's okay. We could zoom on it. It's correct. Yeah, I think it's that's fine. That's correct seems, to do. Seems good. Uh, we can take the last view here. Go on. The last view like that. You, you are ready? Ready to do it? And it should be the last one. So, Dr. Mito? so if she could Big take shot. Ticagrelor, I okay. would love to give her Ticagrelor. I think it's fine. Um, yeah. Jean, I would so love for her question, to take Ticagrelor for at least a, a month. Minutes, but, uh, I am so, Dr. Mito? So, uh, yeah, from the I'm technical sure standpoint, agree. what is the uh, most the benefit for the, this DK crush, other than uh, th uh, the other techniques? Uh, now I just think that, you know, she presented with unstable angina, she had a STEMI, mm -hmm. uh, she fits for a, for a more potent agent if she doesn't have a bleeding issue. Uh, certainly, and you just put in, this a complexity of the disease really mm -hmm. pushes the ischemic score much higher in this patient. So I would give this patient a potent agent. Well, if you're going to give her clopidogrel, you better check to make sure she's actually responsive to it. Almost, almost there. John, John, for the day. Okay, so now we will uh, remove it, the, the, the sheath. We okay. place the TR band. Trans radio, yes. Approach, right? I must say. And this is fine because we did the uh, fighter trans radial. You see, you, okay. yeah, six French, two wires, two rotoblation mm -hmm. at the rectomy, and the DK crash. And final part with a five millimeter balloon. I, I want to just say, you know, thank you. The John Fazade is for the uh, excellent live, uh, you know, case of transmissions. And, Thank you. Uh, all right, a really good uh, result. Uh, very educational. No, really, right? Uh, right. It's a great honor for us. Thank you. Great, great job. Great honor for us. Great job. And uh, really, uh, our heart. Okay. okay. We go next. Uh, the uh, present lecture. Optimal balancing ischemic and bleeding risk in contemporary PCI practice. Twilight Global Leader and More, presented by Roxanne Miran. Please. Thank you, Dr. Sheban, Dr. Uh, Park, and ladies and gentlemen. It's really my pleasure uh, to talk to you a little bit about this very big issue. And we just saw a very, very complex. Uh, uh, disease where I would say that this patient's ischemic load is a lot higher than its bleeding load. And I think it's important to kind of think about that in the context of when we're treating patients. We're constantly balancing the ischemia versus uh, the, um, uh, the bleeding issue. And why we care about that is that in an acute coronary syndrome patient, obviously we're very concerned about the culprit lesion and the and, and the uh, issues that can happen there, but that same patient is at a higher risk for recurrent events. And after PCI, these patients continue to be exposed to ischemic events, and we see that residual ischemic event of about 10 to 15 percent in the patients. And the current treatment options are really dual, dual antiplatelet therapies for these patients to reduce these ischemic events. And we certainly have a tremendous amount of data now that if we prolong dual antiplatelet therapies in patients who have had an acute coronary syndrome, who have had stents placed, who have tolerated a year, maybe we can have a very much better result in preventing future events. And, the, and this uh, DAPT study um, really did show a reduction in those ischemic events, uh, and they were mostly not related to the stent, 
Also, 55% of the reduction of myocardial infarctions were outside of the stent, and you could see that big reduction that continued to occur over time in the patient who actually, these patients were most, for the most part, were stable ischemic heart disease patients. And certainly there was no question that the longer duration of DAPT really reduced all of the major adverse uh, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events, especially stent thrombosis and myocardial infarction. But when you put all of the data together, you, with all of the clinical trials that are there, if you prolong DAPT, you will reduce ischemic uh, load. If you shorten duration of DAPT, you will reduce bleeding. And the big question is, if you have new generation stents, can you still um, get away with a shorter duration of DAPT in some of these patients. And certainly we saw from the meta-analysis that we performed that there was a P interaction for the second generation, next generation DES such that prolonging dual antiplatelet therapy had lesser of an effect on those patients because if you prolong dual antiplatelet therapy, you will expose patients to that bleeding load. And the bleeding events are very important, and they do lead to worsening um, outcome. Here's data from the uh, ADAPT DES by, by Philippe Genereau, where he showed clearly that post-discharge bleeding, if it occurred, had a very, very high probability of mortality uh, in two years after um, uh, stenting, and so, and it was just as important, if not more important, than uh, bleeding events, uh, than ischemic events. And furthermore, there was a very, very important central illustration of why is it that there is this association with increased bleeding in the patients who have um, uh, increased mortality in the patients who have had a, a bleeding events, and what he tried to show is that when there's bleeding, there's discontinuation of dual antiplatelet therapies and other issues. It's a multifactorial issue that somehow, not perhaps directly causal, but there is a, a very clear association with mortality down the line. And so we really want to use the bleeding avoidance strategies. And in the case we saw today, those strategies were used. A radial approach, and the patient is going to be followed. And the question is, um, how, can we, how can we mitigate the increased bleeding risk? Can we do a shorter duration of DAPT in those patients who might have a risk of bleeding? Because there is a very, very good correlation that if you prolong dual DAPT in all of the patients, you can, you do have increased bleeding-related deaths. There's no question about that based on the meta-analysis just performed by Tullio Palmerini. And the prolongation of the, um, of the uh, with the next generation DES, the prolongation of DAP may outweigh the ischemic risk reduction. So walking that fine balance that we all do every single day, it might need to become much more individualized and personalized by looking at patient-related factors, anatomic-related factors, and stent-related factors. And you can really decide whether you should do less than 12 months or more than 12 months, depending on where your patient is. So if I have a diabetic patient in whom I've placed bifurcation stenting with a DK crush, and the patient presented with an acute coronary syndrome, this patient should receive most likely prolonged dual antiplatelet therapies. And certainly the patient we just saw now, probably if they don't have a high bleeding risk, I would prolong DAPT as long as I can because I think this patient will have more events. But how else can we make judgments? Does it have to be just through a chart with our own gestalt or can we use some of the risk scores? Well. There, we developed a risk score called the Paris risk score that gives you a risk for bleeding and a risk, an integer risk for thrombotic events. But smoking 
and chronic kidney disease are on both of these. And you just really have to figure out what, where is the threshold and where does the risk benefit fall into a place where you are away from harm and towards the benefit of the patient. And you could really plot the risk of bleeding and the risk of thrombosis and see where your patient is falling and follow that direction. The DAP score is another way to look at this. This is more about a patient who's tolerated a, a whole year of DAP, and you're there at your office trying to decide if you should prolong dual antiplatelet therapies. And here, you get a net adverse clinical event, a NACE, a net benefit ratio. And if your the DAP score is greater than, than two, then you really, really should be prolonging your dual antiplatelet therapies. Another score that has come to, to play is the precise DAP score, and that's also very, very good in predicting bleeding. But balancing this, um, this ischemia and bleeding becomes extremely important and should be very, very interesting to do. How do we um, go forward now with everything that we have? If we are going to use more and more uh, antiplatelet, anticoagulant regimens, are we to continue to stack it on top of what we are already treating these patients? Because all we're doing is increasing bleeding and we're not allowing those new anticoagulants to do their jobs. And one of the big things uh, that came out most recently is that the trials need to actually look at treatment withdrawal instead of stacking those therapies. And this changing paradigm of with antiplatelet monotherapy as opposed to dual and triple therapy is a very, very good example that came out of MATCH where they looked at the whether addition of aspirin to clopidogrel could have a greater benefit than clopidogrel al alone in patients um, with uh, vascular events and potentially high bleeding risk, 7,600 patients, and they actually did see a increased uh, intracranial hemorrhage without any change in the ischemic um, uh, complications in this match trial showing that you could get away with just having um, withdrawing aspirin and moving forward. And the WUST trial did that beautifully in AFib patients where they did show an incredible benefit in reduction of bleeding and actually an, a reduction in ischemic events. And so others with um, in AFib trials like in Redual and in Pioneer we did the same thing where we withdrew aspirin and these patients had less bleeding with no ischemic um, ischemic endpoint issues, and here's their ischemic endpoint with dual therapy being very, very similar. The same with the rivaroxaban-based strategy, we were able to show a reduction of bleeding without any evidence of an increase uh, mortality or ischemic events. So this entire paradigm of antiplatelet therapy going to monotherapy is something for us to think about. And what's going on right now are several trials of antiplatelet monotherapy after PCI. The one I'm extremely proud of is the Twilight study where we started PCI in high-risk patients who were discharged home on aspirin and clopidogrel, aspirin and ticagrelor for one, for three whole months. At three months, they're evaluated and randomized to ticagrelor plus placebo versus ticagrelor plus aspirin, double-blind, placebo-controlled. We are completed our randomization of 7,200 patients where we enrolled 9,000 patients, and we included these very high-risk patients. But very important study is the Global Leaders Trial with an all-comers PCI population of both ACS and stable CAD, 16,000 patients with a one month of aspirin and ticagrelor versus standard of care. We'll see those data very, very soon at the European Society of Cardiology. So with that, we see that there's a tremendous um, drive into moving towards withdrawal of therapies rather than stacking the therapies, and hopefully we'll have some answers for you in the next year with a lot of exciting studies. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Roxana. And now we go to a, we have a great debate about should the old CTOs be open? 
We have uh, Gerald Werner uh, Pro. He will be presenting now. Please. Thank you, Imad. It's a great honor to speak here and, of course, uh, to debate with S.J. Park. Uh, let me start the presentation. I hope it's coming up. For a debate, I need some material on the oh. slide. <laughs> SJ's behind this. Ah, <laughs> that's the bug. Okay, should all CTOs be opened? Well, this is a CTO, or more than one CTO, in a 55-year-old patient. He has stable symptoms. He even uh, played football in his pastime. Although he did not play in the field anymore, he was goalkeeper. He would tell you occasional tightness in his breast, but you see CTO of the circ, CTO of the right, and collaterals. But is this harmless? Can these collaterals prevent ischemia? No. They can prevent the myocardial infarction. But if we put ischemia to test in collateralized CTOs, we see that the FFR in a collateralized region is always well beyond the threshold that was discussed in the previous session. So there is ischemia. Why should we open the CTO? To improve prognosis is always the highest goal, to live longer, but also to live symptom-free and an unaffected life. I will give you just a brief points on that we have evidence that CTO is not harmless. If you look at the registry from Amsterdam, patients who had an MI and came uh, and STEMI and had in addition um, often unknown CTO, they died within the first 30 days at 24% as compared to a patient who had just the STEMI. And the further prognosis was further affected. Patient with severe LV dysfunction who received ICDs for primary prevention they die more often if they have a CTO as the cause of their ischemic disease. Here you see these tri uh, data from the VACTO registry. Just highlighting a few aspects. But the main question is, can we change the fate by opening the CTOs in this patient? There is an abundance in registries now, several 30,000 patients in various meta-analysis uh, presented here with a classical technique, pre-DAS era or post-DAS era, where we all see in the meta-analysis an improvement of survival. Also, the caveat is, it's not compared to medical therapy, it's always compared to unsuccessful PCI. And that, of course, is a problem. But of, we have no randomized trial to confirm these findings. This is certainly one of the biggest and best investigated, reg investigated registry from the United Kingdom, showing again a survival benefit if you open a CTO. But you also see the mortality over four years is just four, five, six percent. So the difference is two and a half percent at four years. What they also showed is that the greatest benefit comes if you have a complete revascularization as compared to an incomplete revascularization related to the CTO. That is in accordance what we have learned from syntax. If we look at syntax total occlusion groups, and there were a lot of CTOs included in the syntax trial, you see that the incomplete revascularization, especially in the PCI arm, was connected to a higher event rate. Similar, uh, in the cabbage group, this was less affected. What we learned was, if we leave lesions behind, like as assessed then by the residual syntax score, the outcome of the patient is affected. It's very striking that if you have a residual syntax score of more than eight, the mortality is three times higher as compared to those who are just left alone with a low lesion index. And the high residual syntax score is almost always related to a CTO left behind. You may remember that the CTO revascularization rate in the PCI arm was just 50% at that time. 
But we have no trial to really uh, under, uh, underscore this observation that we can change the fate. But I think if we deal with stable angina to have a symptom-free life unaffected by physical limitations, that's a very good goal for any medical intervention. As compared to medical therapy in coronary artery disease, we shouldn't forget this is not perfect. This is just one of the trials about ranolazin. Look what ranolazin at two times 1,000 milligrams a day, actually a dose that no one in Germany ever tolerates, uh, re, uh, achieves. It's two episodes of angina as compared to three episodes with placebo. So this is less than perfect medical therapy. And you should add beta blockers, nitrates, calcium antagonists. And any patient who lives symptom-free without side effects can be congratulated. On the opposite, if you look at what we can achieve with opening an artery, here the open CTO registry results on angina frequency by opening the artery after one month, you achieve a high increase in angina frequency from 70 to 90%. And also the physical limitation is almost to a normal value of 100%. This again is a registry. Alas, we have some randomized data now. The EuroCTO trial presented one year ago did undertake the randomization of patients with a CTO. But note that the randomization was done after treating all non-CTO lesions. We had not very many patients, 400 uh, patients around, but if you measure SAQ, the Seattle Angina Questionnaire, as an endpoint, that is a highly powered study. We had not many crossovers, so actually our, inten uh, our analyzers could relate to on intention to treat. I don't discuss the decision CTO, I'm sure SJ Park will talk about, but the main difference of is that randomization in decision CTO was one step earlier than in our study. We treated non-occlusive lesions before randomization and not after randomization. The main results are here shown, physical limitation improved, but the main effect was angina frequency reaching the statistical endpoint of 0.01 or going even below, and the quality of life. So at a power of 81%, the endpoints that were uh, primary efficacy in this study were reached. We m had more patients with a significant improvement in physical limitation, more patients with a significant improvement in angina frequency. Actually, the freedom of, of Ch in China was 71% as compared to 58%. But there are also the so-called asymptomatic patient. I just give you one example of this long CTO in this patient who is normal LV function. However, we tested his exercise capacity. And you note that it was 21 uh, oxygen uptake before opening the CTO. And after opening the CTO, there was an increase by almost 50%. This is typical. The patient doesn't know that he has higher capacity than he really exerts in his daily life. In fact, this was also supported by a small study by my friend Cambis, who showed in a larger population an increase of working capacity in all categories that you can test with a, uh, aero, uh, exercise testing with cardio, uh, cardiopulmonary measurements. We can see reversal of perfusion defects by MRI scans and perfect improvement of perfusion. However, not every ischemic burden is the like. So we should look at the study from Barry, uh, Barry Rutherford's group where they clearly discriminated that you should treat patients with a higher than 10 to 12 percent ischemic burden. Only those will really profit from a CTO revascularization. I think a very important study. Final issue is viability. Of course, we have some patients, I think the number is decreasing because of the success of primary PCI and acute MI. We find less and less patients with an old infarct. 
So the general patient population in CTOs nowadays has normal LV function, but if we have uh, severe dyskinesia, then we should, of course, undergo an MRI testing. However, there is a big problem that the gray zone of 25 to 75 percent scar tissue is too large, and certainly we need more tests or re more refined uh, MRI techniques like this uh, recovery score predi uh, su uh, suggested by Kirschbaum and colleagues, which is not used because it's not highly published in the International Journal of Cardiology. But this viability score seems to be a very good predictor of recovery, even in scar tissue. So for me, the question is not when to open, but when not to open. In the post-MI patient without viable myocard, in CTOs with small territory of ischemia without related symptoms, and of course we have to take the patient into consideration, severe comorbidity and limited life expectancy, then we should certainly uh, uh, avoid a lengthy and complex procedure. Thank you. Well, to uh, come back and say should, no way should all CTOs be open, we go to our S.J. Park, Dr. Park. Thank you. Uh, I think it's quite the same, you know, uh, opinion, so, so we don't have any debate <laughs> with you. Okay, uh, look at this, 43 very young uh, gentlemen, LED CTO with a, a relatively good collaterals, actually no symptoms, normal perfusion scan. This is quite extreme cases, and exercise performance is good, negative, uh, you know, treadmill, and good collateral. Uh, Gerald, do you want to open for this patient? Already open, okay. And another case is 75, RCCTO, quite good collateral, no symptoms, the reversible ischemia is a medium size or something. Look at this, absolutely negative, you know, treadmill exercise test. And still, do you want to open, right? You want to open. So, uh, it's contradictory, right? You get the patient, so 43, so gentleman, asymptom, atypical symptom. Anyway, normal salient perfusion scan, negative treadmill exercise test. Do you want to call any angiogram further? Why did you do that? This is evidence-based medicine, right? In a outpatient, a young patient, uh, you know, come to uh, come to me and negative treadmill, negative silent perfusion scan. Still, you wanted the crony age room for further. So you got some bias, All right? Look at that one. Why still uh, do you want to open? You just mentioned about the improved quality of life, improved long-term survival. Uh, particular this patient, this is one of the extremes. Already good enough, uh, you know, <laughs> quality of life. Uh, you. Mention about, you know, the VMAX, all right, VMAX concern is maximum stress that they don't make some small difference. Then maybe, really, do you want to relate it with, uh, you know, survival benefit in quality of life in the user? All right, I don't think so. Improved survival benefit, I don't believe it. The benefit of CTOP is not different with the other, other, other diseases. Absolutely, meta-analysis clearly demonstrate <coughs> And those of our benefit of angioplasty, PCI over medication, just only benefit angina's. I agree that for Euro CTO trial, something. Courage, 15 years, no survival benefit anymore. So compared with, uh, as if you look at the inside, Courage still have a multi vessel disease, you know, proxy involved with more than 30%. The reason why, actually, the Survival benefit, you know, you know that a large ischemic burden at least more than 10%. Uh, you look at that one, it's mainly related to the main disease, multi vessel disease. However, any single vessel CTO actually is relatively small ischemic burden. I don't believe it's more than 10% in ischemic burden in any you know, single uh, CTO region. So do you still want to open single vessel CTO, right? However, look at this. Just the previous two, two cases, 
Various ischemic threshold, we're going to confirm. So we're going to still, you know, we, uh, we have conducted some studies in terms of CTO, 90% of uh, stenosis is approximately. However, I believe the CTO lesion has uh, various ischemic threshold due to various collateral circulation. Just only all the data is the FFR concern as long-standing hibernation, you know, long-standing, you know, stunning, something like it, it is not uh, a representative of normal myocardial <clears throat> uh, small vessel uh, status. No ruptures, you know that. Totally occluded the vessel and clinically, I believe, more stable. The meaning is this is extreme cases and small uh, normal silent, silent persons get no symptoms, you know, negative exercise tests. The, the meaning is not many cases actually a single vessel CTO with a symptomatic and a large ischemic burden more than 10%. You know that, I know. In, the, in the, our, you know, our patient clinic, and many patients, single CTO patient has no symptom, is quite happy to, you know, uh, his life. And so optimal medical treatment would be effective for uh, many, uh, I don't know, single best CTO lesion. So who should undergo CTOs? We know that survival benefit of revascularization is clear for multivessel disease. There's a recent published data, almost, uh, you know, all the randomized studies, including 11,000 patients, uh, PCI process surgery, multivessel, and the main disease clearly demonstrate the patient group who had a diabetic and multivessel disease has better outcomes with the bypass surgery rather than the PCI. So why CAB is better? We, know, we don't know exact reason why. However, recent issue of incomplete vascularization and Diabetic concern is really is a large ischemic burden, diffuse disease, and so a totally different, you know, different characteristics of bypass surgery and PCI, local treatment concern. We have some data, uh, patient-level meta-analysis, uh, any cause, death, M, uh, death, MI stroke, if you look at that one, in PCI group, complete revascularization is almost the same with the bypass surgery. Uh, exactly the same finding as the test and my stroke. Incomplete revascularization, it will be higher, you know, uh, maze weight. And so multivessel, this is the absolutely, you know, guideline concern is low syntax score as one, class 1B, level of evidence B. And so any difference? For multivessel disease with the CTO lesion, so I think it's totally different from multivessels with the CTO lesion. I think it's more dangerous. The reason why the disease is non CTO, CTO vessel should supply larger ischemic burden, including CTO territories, and multivessel with the CTO lesion is more or less just, you know, just to show that this slide, higher mortality in patient multivessel disease, ST elevation MI. MI patients, non infect related to the CTO included is a higher mortality rather than the. So, another example 76 male patients, so three vessel, LAD CTO here, so right coronary disease, circumflex disease, definitely, you know, stable angina. J is a CT score three, is a little bit of mechanic, um, technically, is uh, difficult to open good collaterals. And uh, to be honest, what I did. I uh, treat a PCID as non-CTO lesion, RCA and circumflex, and optimal medical treatment for LAD CTO lesion. So what I saw is a successful DS implantation for non-CTO lesions, and the remaining single LAD CTO lesion itself is, would be even better than incomplete revascularized other multivessel disease subset. And so uh, if you look at the real practice, there's three options. Multivessel disease, CTO lesion, the bypass surgery, and non-CTO PCI with the remaining CTO, kind of incomplete vascularization, however, a little bit different uh, with the multivessel disease subset, CTO PCI with complete vascularization. And so we analyzed our data, uh, tissue and CTO registry, including 2,000 uh, 300 patients, real practice, multivessel with the CTO, look at this, more than 45.6% of patients we treated with a non-CTO PCI with just the remaining CTO lesion, and 36.7% CTO PCI with a complete vascularization, relatively J score is lower, at, you know, and almost 20% of patients we uh, send the patient to the bypass surgery. So, 
This is a city of studies. We are still struggling, you know, to popularize our data. Courage like a randomized study, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, interpreted city of region eligible for PCI, just PCI for OMT randomization. Single vessel CTO, simply randomized, the PCI versus optimal medical treatment. Multi vessel with a CTO region, actually PCI for CTO region with a non CTO PCI, optimal medical treatment the CTO region with a non CTO PCI. The meaning is any multi vessel CTO region is going to make uh, some non CTO region. Uh, PCI, stem procedure, and so finally, ultimately, uh, we are remaining into a single uh, vessel CTO, and so we uh, observe clinical outcome three years, and well balanced between the two, 62 years in 34% diabetics, and stable anginals, mainly RAD, right coronary arteries, multi-vessel involved, the actually is more than 74%, uh, lot, you know, many uh, percent of uh, uh, including patient as a multi vessel disease. Primary endpoint, that's my stroke, any repeated vascularizations, ITT, intention to treat analysis is absolutely no different uh, between the two. And so, I would, uh, practical message from our study optimal medical treatment for single CTO region is uh, mostly safe and effective. In case of a multi vessel with a CTO region, so non CTO region PCI with optimal medical treatment for remaining CTO would be enough in real world practice. Who should undergo a CTO PCI? Should it be considered in the presence of symptoms, viability, or ischemia, ischemic burden is more than at least 10%, revascularization come for the clinical benefit in patient with a diabetic, multi vessel disease with a CTO. So, I would suggest a practical algorithm for CTO. Single vessel CTO, stable angina, don't touch. Medically refractory angina, I don't believe too much. However, you know, in those cases, we have, we, we're gonna do the PCI. However, in the practical issues, I believe, you know, stable angina is much, much, you know, uh, bigger, so. Uh, then the unstable. Multi-vessel CTO, simple CTO region, J-score less than two, why not? We can do the complete uh, revascularization CTO PCI. However, complex CTO region subset, cavity, especially for diabetic patients, complex CTO, and sometimes non-CTO PCI only uh, almost, uh, you know, 40 Six percent of our registry data it is required acceptable alternative uh, treatment modality of multi vessel with a uh, CTO. I believe so. Get that. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Uh, all right. Another CTO is there. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So I think this is, uh, you know, I don't know that we have a full answer. It seems to me, Gerard, would you like to come up so we can just have a little bit of a discussion? I mean, I think um, there were no clear, complete clear answers. I think what you just drew out for us makes a great deal of sense, doesn't it? If there's no ischemia, no symptoms, what are we doing for these patients? How do you respond to that? Yes. I thought that you would probably agree with that. If there's no symptoms, no ischemia, everything looks good, there's a CTO, why are you going after that CTO? Having uh, spent uh, a lot of my time with studying collaterals, uh, SJ found really exceptional result, uh, examples of proximal RCAs and a proximal LED. It will be rare and you have to challenge the ex exercise test or ischemia test in these patients. But even given this 43-year-old patient has no ischemia, he is 43-year-old and achieved already a CTO. This is one of the few patients where I'm adamant that his future prognosis will be affected by having a CTO because in the next 30 years he will have the likelihood of an MI even under OMT. And we know that this patient is at a high risk of dying from the MI. But otherwise... What about the congenital single coronary arteries? Some patient in the single coronary arteries from the left coronary supply the whole right side. Is there, is there any difference in terms of... I mean, I think
think SJ made a very good point, though. If there is no symptom, there are many, many patients who are asymptomatic young patients in whom we didn't do, even do an angiogram and we don't know that they have a CTO. There could be people so, that have that. And I think that was his point. But I think what you're saying is that just having a CTO on an angiogram is basically saying this is a high risk patient at some point, some burden of atherosclerosis, uh, future events. So uh, the question is why did the patient receive an angel? He mustn't have been completely symptomless because otherwise I don't do angels in 43 year old patients. I see a lot of CTO patients and they are so called asymptomatic but they adapt because it's a stable situation and they don't exercise as much as they would do but their quality of life will be improved when be open viable myocard. And I would challenge that uh, SJ Parks mentioning that hardly ever a CTO has more than 10% ischemic burden. Because if we have a proximal co-dominant RCA occlusion, then 20% of the myocard is subtended by this uh, right coronary artery. Still, the myocardium size concern is very much various, even in the proximity. Not too much, you know, a case is of 10% or more than a large ischemic burden. So, as you mentioned, this is extreme cases. We know that. We, we got some data. More than 90% uh, had a CTO patient, you know, clear some ischemic evidence. We know that. However, what I'm talking is, why don't you think a uh, simple CTO region is it totally different with the 90% of, uh, you know, proximity region? There are lots of data that we have. Right, single vessel, any single vessel interventions uh, actually mm, cannot make a, a real survival benefit. You mentioned about the small LV dysfunction, the LDM or something like that. That is one of the extreme concerns. You know, ejection fraction is. You know, look at that. Forty-five percent ejection fraction improved. To Forty uh, eight, uh, fifty percent. No, nothing. Vmax improved. The quality of life, delta quality of life is improved rather than you know medical treatment or something like. That. Is it a positive finding? Nothing. Further. In terms of a survival benefit, hard endpoint no, concerns. No, we well, don't treat uh, CTOs for survival benefit in our patients. Right. It's a stable angina patient, and we treat only for symptoms. The only debate is whether the patient is symptomatic or not, exactly and that is the matter of a good issues, physical right. exam. Symptomatic, yeah? symptomatic, right? Well, I think we we this is great. I'm yeah. liking this. No, but I mean, I think if you kind of think about it, you're both saying very similar things that what you want to do is if you are going to go after a CTO, and it's not that, it's not every CTO, and you both said the same, it should be in the symptomatic patient with ischemia. And I think that's one of the problems of, let's say, some of the studies we did see where there was no benefit because we didn't know if they had ischemia to begin with. And I think that's really important that the appropriateness of the, of the uh, procedure is there based on some ischemia, some symptoms, and a large territory at, at risk. And I believe, especially given what we have today, because SJ, I must tell you, if you look at the New York State cabbage uh, registry, the, one of the most important reasons that people are undergoing a lot of cabbage is presence of a CTO. They're sending the patient to cabbage, and those uh, uh, arteries are being bypassed. And so in my mind, I wonder, maybe we could have avoided a lot of cabbage in a lot of patients if we didn't think that way, if we thought the way you dissected, look for the, um, uh, a CTO that's easy to be open, open that CTO. If there is ischemia, open the CTO. And even in the complex cases, I think we have great technology to open CTOs. I think we're in a different place now where we should be looking at these patients in a very, very um, systematic fashion and always going after ischemia. I don't know that we'll have all the answers. Dr. Sheban, any last moments before we close the no, session? No, actually, I, I agree, totally agree that uh, total occlusion should be open, particularly in single vessel disease, should be based on 
symptoms or is documentation of ischemia and ischemic burden is very important. That means should be large area of ischemia, not small area of ischemia. All right, well, this is great. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all. Thank <laughs> you.